Welcome to the Sales versus Marketing Podcast, where we speak with sales, marketing, and business leaders. I'm your host, Scott, and today we are speaking with Dara Grove White. Now, Dara is a uh, is a career marketer. Uh, he currently is, uh, he just actually left uh, his last firm to start his own digital marketing company, this one marketing based out of British Columbia, uh, Canada. So Dara is an extremely successful marketer. He started actually his career in sales and then transitioned into marketing. He literally wrote the book on sales psychology and selling uh, human interaction and body language. And then he went on to uh, be wildly successful as a brand strategist, digital marketing strategist, uh, and general marketing director at TEDx Victoria, uh, moving into uh, another firm, LJ uh, Welding and Automation. He built out their digital marketing campaign from the ground up uh, and ran a successful career as a director of marketing there before transitioning into his own firm, where he is currently the founder and CEO uh, Dara has a unique blend of both the psychology um, and human drivers of what actually facilitates and, and helps people decide to make a purchase, combined with the understanding of messaging and brand from a marketer's perspective, uh, as well as being very technical in nature. He understands how to leverage digital marketing, growth hacking, and emerging marketing techniques to really bring a brand to the next level uh, and get re- the most dollar value or ROI on their ad spend or marketing spend. So uh, Dara, Dara Grove White is an extremely, extremely interesting marketer. His background, he's been very successful in a variety of different fields that all lend cadence to why he's doing so well right now. So Dara, take it away. Give us a little bit more information about your background, what you're doing now, and what brought you to where you are uh, today. Um, so I am a uh, digital strategist that uh, helps my clients uh, engage decision makers inform stakeholders and mobilize grassroots resources. So that's like the 35,000 foot view, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do that through uh, marketing strategies and growth hacking tactics. Um, basically, the out of a frustration for the big companies like Google and uh, Facebook and stuff like that, uh, I get a, a deep pleasure from gaming their systems because Mm -hmm. how we never gave permission to be have our data weaponized against us and so i get a a deep gratification from returning the favor to them by exploiting their vulnerabilities and so okay so let's talk about so that's great so that's 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 a very cool perspective actually i've never heard a marketer say that but it's it's very true so i i appreciate where you're coming from because i think a lot of people are on the uh the hate the the hate the fang companies right now so (laughs) um yeah so where did you where did you come from because now you are the uh founder ceo of uh this one marketing correct that's that's this one yep this one okay so where did you where did you come from? What's your what's your background? Oh, well, uh, I have a sales background actually, not unlike yourself. Uh, that ever since I was sixteen, uh, I was actually fifteen. I was doing sales. So uh, my first job was uh, actually I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, and it's probably weird to put it on the record, but uh, my first real job was uh, selling credit cards to Americans back when I was a kid. I didn't know what I was doing, and. It, uh, after I kind of realized, uh oh, this is probably not a good thing, I ended up leaving that uh, to do a sales uh, telemarketing at another place called the Buy and Sell Newspaper in Toronto, which I don't, I, th- I don't even think exists anymore now. But I don't think so, no. But <laughs> yeah, just generally newspapers. But um, but I have this this background in sales that then got accentuated through a curiosity in neuro linguistic programming (NLP) which I think most salespeople would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. Just like the the cognitive biases, the unconscious shortcuts that we are constantly taking uh, when we're learning information uh, that I was really curious about. And I I did a lot of of studying. studying. Um, And uh, all the while, I did terribly in school, uh, like real bad, like failed uh, more math classes than anybody I know. I was not, I was also not so great at math. So. <laughs> and it's, uh, when you're going through it at the time, you, you don't always have the perspective of like, Hey, maybe it's not your fault. Yeah. 
Um, maybe there's a problem with the system. Maybe there's the way it's being taught. Well, that's a whole other can of worms that extends far outside the context of, of driving revenue for companies. But yes, I do believe the people that are um, entrepreneurial by nature, which obviously you are, you're like a self learner, you learn a certain way. Um, and you're always trying to learn more and learn more and more and more and grow. I think that that doesn't always work with the way that schools teach over information. Um, so yeah, I've, your story is not, uh, is not so uncommon. Yeah. Um, and it was actually, it was, it was because of the, those failures that I, I think it ended up making me way stronger in the long run. Um, the, just knowing failure and constantly like having to redo things, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, just eventually it, it makes your, your skin stronger. Uh, I, unfortunately, I had to kind of figure out who I was and what my real strengths were and stuff like that. Um, and that obviously, uh, that takes time. But uh, after I dropped out of school, I got into fights, sold drugs, stuff like that when I was a kid. Um, but I eventually went back to school, um, had a bit of a kind of a, a life perspective change. And I wanted to become a doctor like my dad and my grandparents and stuff like that. How old so, are you here when you're just to put a little context around it? So I would have been 20 when I went back to high school after okay. I dropped out for a few years to get in trouble and get in the fights and that kind of thing. Um, but so I, I ended up going back to school and I did so bad at uh, science and math as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, but I ended up finishing high school as an adult and then I, I left to come back to Victoria to do university because I wanted to go into medicine. Um, but the truth is I, I thought I, I was terrible at chemistry and, and physics and stuff. So uh, after some soul searching um, and I was doing a lot of volunteering at a hospital too. Mm -hmm. um, I realized I could still help people by going into business. In fact, I might even be able to help more people and still get to acknowledge that part of who I wanted to become. Do you know what I mean? I do. I think it's, uh, it's very powerful and it's a perspective that I've never really thought of before. But at the end of the day, if you are truly good at what you do, it's because you do want to help people. And I don't think people even realize that because it becomes so uh, routine. But if, you know, even I'm thinking back to when I first started selling and mm -hmm. some of my proudest moments were seeing a customer, like after they've purchased something or whatever, just like smile on their face. Like I've, I, I've worked in one of my first, first jobs. Well, actually not my first job, but one of my jobs when I was younger, when I was still in high school was in retail. And it's like, it's such a simple job that people take for granted. But when you actually solve a problem or when you deliver like that customer experience that you can tell they've never received from somebody in a store before, it's, it's like a very heartwarming feeling. And I think that uh, extrapolated uh, times a thousand to when you're selling large enterprise and you solve organizational issues for customers you still have that feeling of, wow, I've done good. And I think that, unfortunately, a lot of people associate sales with negative and you know, pushing solutions down people's throats that they don't need or trying to manipulate them into buying. Anyone who's good at selling can never maintain, like they don't, first of all, they don't sell like that, but anyone who's good at selling doesn't sell like that. Because if you do sell like that, that is a, that is a, a stressor on yourself that you cannot maintain in perpetuity. So if you are good at selling, you generally are doing good for people um, yeah. and you feel good about it, which is why you're, you know, people are career salesmen. It's not because they love, you know, ruining people's days and, you know, making them commit to things that, and nobody wants to get somebody to commit to something and then have them coming back later and yelling and then escalate. Like, that's not a life that anybody actually wants to live. So when you actually do something good, yeah, um, yeah it, you feel real damn good about it. And like, like what you're saying, I've never thought about it like that. But yeah, you, there's another way to do good for people. And if you can sort of tap into that, I yeah, think you're, you're onto something. The, I mean, uh, to, to the point about like uh, in the retail uh, sales experience to, to give someone an unexpected uh, positive interaction when you go beyond what their expectations of the sales process was supposed to be for them to walk away feeling like, not only was there an external solution, but there was an internal thing that happened as well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a transaction. There was a change or a transformation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very powerful. I like that perspective a lot. And that's not something I've actually ever I've heard when I've spoken to people about uh, sales or marketing. But I, I really, really 
I like that perspective. It's really refreshing that you've acknowledged that. Um, okay, so you wanted to do good by people, but you realized, okay, your forte was not medicine, <laughs> or or at least getting the pre qualifications required to to practice medicine, which is which is fine. Um, God knows I couldn't go back to school for another four, six, eight years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I still ended up volunteering a hospital every week for the next four or six, I guess it was eight years in total, uh, taking on an elderly guy uh, with disabilities. We'd go to the mall. He didn't have any family to visit him. Uh, so I was matched up with him as a, a visitor companion. And we'd go to the mall and have like Tim Hortons coffee and uh, because he was stuck in a wheelchair, it was, it was basically the thing he'd get to look forward to every week. Yeah. And, uh, it's little things like that where you get to make such a big difference in people's lives, uh, that it's just, it's oddly enough, it's very motivating. It's, uh, if you if you're familiar with, uh, Victor Frankl's man's yeah. search for meaning, um, being able to be in touch with purpose and, um, and tangibly experience it. On a regular basis, is uh, it's it's like Zig, was it Zig Ziglar who said uh, uh, motivation is like bathing; you have to do it every day. I, so, I don't know that quote, but I like it though. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, but anyway, I ended up uh, writing an ebook on body language for persuasion. So, just to kind of uh, bring it to the how how the heck did I get here with gaming, yeah. uh, social media, and search engines and stuff like that. Um, so I wrote this ebook uh, that took me three years, and it was on body language and a combination of neurolinguistic programming, basically persuasion stuff, right? Yeah. Um, which, you know, kind of in the big picture of things, marketing and sales, we're ultimately talking about persuasion, right? Just on a micro and a macro. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote the book. I, I did the uh, Amazon publishing, and frankly, I didn't sell very many books, <laughs> like I think a lot of people. And uh, th this was one of the many failures that I can look back on and credit to why and where I got to because of it. Uh, another example was when I was a big brother for Big Brothers Big Sisters, Joey, my, uh, my little, he and I did a fundraising campaign to raise $10,000 to build a school in China. That's where he wanted to build a school. I said, sure, no problem, let's do it. And we did this, um, this micro crowdfunding thing where you reach out to 35 people in your network and say for $3 a day uh, for three months, uh, we all put, put our money together and we build a school for $10,000. Now, I thought this, this was like a sure shot thing. Like this was for sure going to happen. We're going to build a school and it's going to be amazing. And uh, we do these like personal one minute videos, him and uh, Joey and me uh, to, to the people that I invite to join this campaign. And, we only get like three people, three or four people that donated $300 each, which is still a lot of money. And but it's not enough to build a school in China. <laughs> enough to uh, build a school in China. And, you know, at the time, I remember um, on Facebook letting my, my network know, hey, we're doing something exciting. But uh, there was, and this is actually something I never really talked publicly about, but after, after that, I never really followed up with my network about how everything went because there was kind of an embarrassment that we didn't do it right. Um, and I felt like I'm supposed to be this kid's role model and I kind of failed uh, in terms of like building the school, or at least that's how I thought about it. And I was yeah. a bit embarrassed. Um, and uh, I realized like, you know, obviously uh, in retrospect, the fact that we even raised over a thousand dollars in the first place is actually pretty good. And for Joey, who, um, uh, comes from like poverty, unfortunately, like it's, uh, this was a really big deal. So my perspective being like, Hey, we didn't need the 10,000. And then Joey's like, wow, that's a lot of we money. Raise a thousand bucks. Yeah. Which, which was still, you know, but this was another marketing failure, frankly, that I, I experienced. Uh, and another one was when I was in student politics and I lost by eight votes, you know, and it was, it, there was a lot more than eight votes. I think it was like several hundred, but I, but that was another marketing communications or persuasion failure that made me realize that there was, there's a lot to be learned here. You know, and they say failure is the best teacher. Yeah. So, I think, I think what's really interesting is you literally wrote a book on, 
on psychology and how to build, how to, how to persuade people, but your lessons learned weren't just from researching and learning. It was the actual failures that are prompting you to sort of learn and grow. Even though you literally wrote the book on how to do it, it's like you still had to fail to learn how to do it, which yeah. I think is such a, a strong indicator of, of how important it is to, to fail, but to take those learnings and to move on to the next level, next stage. Yeah. I mean, to, to, you know, they call it, there's recycling and then there's upcycling. And this is an example of like, okay, I junked it, but I can upcycle it into something better. I like that. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so those, yeah, those, uh, those uh, intimate and personal and public failures uh, to lose an election by eight votes and have people tell you, hey, they voted for you and uh, how did it go? And constantly saying, well, I lost or, um, yeah, the, the, the building a school, just for it to be so public and to be vulnerable and to fail and to still keep trying, you know, yeah. um, that was uh, uh, that was a test of character, too. I mean, or at least a, a trial of character. I agree. I think it's it, they always say that if you want to hold yourself accountable to something, you put it out in the, in the open and you make it public. So okay. to to continue to do that and to continue to, to fail, but grow. And I think that fail is a, a harsh word. So like you said, it's all about perspective. Yeah. So how many people took three years and successfully published a book? Yeah, maybe you didn't sell so many, but how many people haven't been able to finish a book? An example for, you know, your, your big brothers, uh, your little, he, he thought a thousand dollars was a ton of money. Oh, so it's all, it still is, it still is perspective, which is actually sort of speaking more to your personality as somebody who expects high things and expects yourself to deliver more than your actual quote unquote failures. In, in my opinion, at least I think it's more a testament to your incredible personality as opposed to um, your, your lack of being able to succeed because in some people's mind, you did succeed several times, but, yep. but it's a, uh, it's our standards that we hold yeah. ourselves to that. I mean, we'll think about it this way. If I considered those successes, it's a, like this is a thought experiment, but if I did, would would I have kept trying as hard uh, because I didn't interpret it as a rejection or a failure? Good point. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's so, okay. So, all right. So you those so lessons learned. So where are we now? So continue continue the story. <laughs> so I yeah I, I realized that uh, there there's a lot of people like me out there that wrote a book or that uh, produced the great thing and that there was no audience for it, right? Mm -hmm. That there's, there's a disconnect between creator and distribution. A big one. Yeah. A dramatic one, actually. In fact, like, uh, I've, I've uh, created some how-tos of how to basically get your uh, video indexed properly for search engines because there's so many great videographers out there um, and so much great content out there uh, that just doesn't get any traction because... People don't understand um, the indexing process, uh, the distribution process, how that really works. Um, they just think that once you make that great content, it'll get found. And that's just not the case. So uh, with, with those failures like the ones I've described, uh, or at least a couple of them, it was uh, creating stuff is only half the battle. You know, the other half is like figuring out, okay, who am I creating this stuff for? As a sales and marketing professional, you have to know your audience. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do good communication. You know? So how did you learn? How did you learn or how did, you know, I guess you've learned throughout your career, but how did you learn how to bridge that gap? The, I would say that, uh, you know, after finishing uh, my university degree in uh, business, uh, just as I was finishing it, I did a, a HubSpot certification on inbound marketing. Mm -hmm. And that was an introduction for me on uh, a very serious change that's going through the marketing industry where, you know, legacy media is all about interruptive marketing, where it, it interrupts your experience, uh, negative user experience. But we're used to it, right? Like think radio, commercials, um, uh, newspaper ads, things that, you know, kind of get in your way versus... Uh, like great lead generation where you're 
you're putting out the breadcrumbs for people to find how to solve their problem and then to know who to go to uh, for that. So there was a, a paradigm shift uh, with the inbound, the HubSpot inbound marketing uh, course that I took. That was really helpful. In fact, I created a, a marketing director position for the industrial automation company I was working with for about five years. So I created a position uh, out of this, what was originally just a sales job, uh, a, a marketing, and I built a marketing department. It's, was, was it a case of them not understanding the value of inbound marketing because it was more of a legacy industry? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, they're, they're very much a legacy industry in that uh, oil and gas was their main customer. And they were one of the first to get into paid ads, like back 10 years ago. Uh, and they didn't think they had to do much, much different. And it, because it's a slower to change industry, they, um, there, there just wasn't an urgency. It wasn't a tech company like, say, like a SaaS company or something mm-hmm. like that, where uh, it's very cutting edge. And uh, yeah, technologically driven. So okay, so this is great because you you created the position because you saw the opportunity because of your experience. Um, how did you build out and how did you walk this legacy organization through a digital transformation in the marketing arena? Because that's essentially what your your job was. It was bringing them up to speed. So walk us through that. Well. Uh, if, I, I think probably uh, one of the most valuable uh, nuggets of this process was to fr- when you're doing something that's going to potentially have a big impact or a big change and it threatens uh, people's normal way of doing things and their comfort level, uh, instead of uh, calling it what it is, a big change, uh, reframing it for people to get buy-in, because this is one of the hardest parts about it, is getting your... Um, uh, in uh, uh, change management. Well, I was uh, actually going to ask you about managing up because I know that I'm sure you encountered pushback. So, but but continue. Well, sorry. Often and regularly, but this is this one little hack. Well, for anybody listening that is feeling challenged by uh, the senior leadership in that they don't feel empowered to do their jobs because senior leadership is saying, "Hold on, hold on." Uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm. I'm not on board with this yet. The trick is, call it a pilot project. It takes the. It takes the edge out of it. It. It makes it. Um, it even gets them on board with wanting to experiment too. But obviously, you don't want them to mess with your experiment. So you say, "Hey, that's a great idea. Let's put that on the list of projects that we can also experiment with as a pilot. But this is going to be separate from your pilot." Right? But to get people excited about change, this little hack, call it a pilot, call it a pilot project, you know, because it, it, uh, it doesn't feel like it's much of a risk. You feel like you're able to take experiments. And then you show them the value and you show them, you show them the ROI or you show them the increased brand awareness or MQLs, whatever KPI or metric you're. So I like that. That's because managing up, like you said, is, is by far the most difficult thing to do. Oh, and a changing of the guard that's happening, or at least has been happening for the last six years, as the uh, baby boomer generation uh, starts to, you know, uh, retire and younger generations are taking on uh, leadership positions. There's still some of the older dogs out there that um, that barely use email properly, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, although they have a wealth of experience uh, and knowledge, uh, they're... Unfortunately, the way that they've always been doing things uh, interferes with the, the way that things could be done better. Mm-hmm. So, okay, so you, you, started, you started sort of optimizing and augmenting this company's marketing presence. Well, is, is that, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so uh, the, basically this end would end up becoming my whole uh, business process as a yeah. marketer. Uh, but the, the, at least the first part, uh, which I think ans- will answer your question, is, well, how do you do that? The first thing is to identify what are your KPIs? What, are, what is your real strategy? Who are you trying to reach? What, what are your business goals? Uh, in, in the case of this company, it was getting more leads. 
getting more website visitors, getting more website visitors to engage on site, to convert, right? These were, um, at the time, we thought uh, social media was a, an important KPI, which, you know, to some degree it still is, but it's not really um, for this company. But how many followers, you know, just basically getting all your key performance indicators. I keep yeah. saying, guys, I should stop using jargon for, for those uh, who just, you know, uh, but yeah, figuring out what are the, what are the key business, um, goals and then get baselines. You don't know how many, uh, leads you get per month. Okay. Well, let's today. We're going to get that. Yeah. You don't know how much the customer acquisition cost is through, uh, social paid social. Okay. Yeah. Let's get a, let's get a benchmark for it. You can't improve what you're not measuring. So do you think that, um, because some of these things. It's so funny. For some people listening, this is like, how do you operate a business without these KPIs? It doesn't make sense. You're just you're just flying blindly. So yeah. do you see this a lot with companies without singling out companies, but with companies you work with as a consultant, uh, do you see that people don't even set those KPIs and they're just kind of spending money here, there, everywhere, hoping that business comes in? No rhyme, reason, understanding. 100%. The, uh, the, the nice thing about when you frame it as a pilot, you're able to get the parameters set up so that you know what you're looking for. You and I have probably seen this a lot, that um, advertising is a big black hole for a lot of people. Uh, it's just a big, uh, big money pit. If you don't have the parameters set up for like, what are your goals for everything? You know? Um, and yeah, if you... For, it's it bonkers how many big companies actually don't have a good grasp on those key metrics. And it, uh, unfortunately, I, th I think that it breeds mediocrity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's, it's no longer objective or it's, it's not yet objective. Uh, if someone's doing a good job, it's all subjective. It's like, hey, I like the way that looks, so let's run it. Yeah. Versus, hey, the, control, um, the group, the, the market research group says, hey, this is definitely a better converting message. Let's run with that as a test, right? I think that uh, that's why you're seeing some companies, uh, the lifespan of a, a CMO or a chief marketing officer is getting shorter and shorter as they start measuring these KPIs against the campaigns they run. And I think that, you know, the, the, sale, the, the lifespan of a, a VP sales is already between 16 to 18 months in a large company. But I think the CMO is catching up as they're not properly able to uh, show ROI or, or return on investment for ad dollars spent or you know, or, the, or whatever KPI because now there's so many tools that you can use to measure these things whereas there wasn't all so maybe in larger businesses we're seeing this shift probably more predominant obviously because they have the money to spend on all these uh, analytics insights tools and they know how to use them and they can probably hire the talent that can say listen this guy's ineffective whereas some of the smaller companies may still be flying blind if they don't have uh, that understanding they can be making good money. But if they don't, if the if the founder is not uh, a, a marketing individual, um, and you're hiring a firm that isn't transparent, uh, then he could be spending or she could be spending quite a bit of money, and it, it could still be a black hole. So, yeah. um, is that how you differentiate yourself when you work with companies? Yeah. So I mean, when when we're doing this baseline thing, there's a a huge education component, right? Like being able to talk about uh, uh, SEO is one of my specialties. And so explaining uh, how SEO works, uh, what's basically, you know, similarly when, uh, when I talk about like growth hacking different platforms, you got to understand the, the philosophy be behind how it was created and how it works and why it works the way it does. And then you can start finding out the ways that are, it's exploitable, right? Um, and so with clients, uh, a lot of people unfortunately get taken in marketing. It, it seems to be one of those things that um, there's a lot of charlatans out there. There's a lot of people that say they know how to do things. And, uh, there's just, uh, it's, it's disappointing because I see, I've seen people that, uh, overpay for marketing all the time because they just don't know they, they're getting uh, mystified by jargon rather than having things explained in really simple terms. So, uh, marketing is, a uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, it has the potential to be abused. Uh, you know, I mean, well, I think, it, 
I think even like traffic, like if you look at the the total amount of traffic on the internet, there's some ridiculous stats out there that like 50 to 60% of the total traffic on the internet is all bots and, and all fake and not real traffic. And how do you, how do you combat that? So, okay. So that's a great question. How would a company know what to look for when they're hiring somebody, a firm or an individual within their organization so that they can be more effective and they can measure uh, the, the results? How, what should they look for when is there, is there, I guess, um, best practices or could there be tools that they could use? Uh, that's sort of like the pathway that I'm trying to, I'm going down a little bit because you're speaking about how opaque, uh, marketing is. How do they make it more transparent? Okay. So, um, like what would be a, a good litmus test? Yes. Yeah. On, yeah, exactly. On, uh, when interviewing marketing professionals. That, that sounds like a good way to phrase my question. <laughs> be a good litmus test it would be how quickly and how soon they ask about the customer versus what they think is good marketing so how um how customer obsessed they are or how t- uh, uh marketing segment obsessed they are yeah right because there's there is no shortage there's a big difference between uh tacticians and strategists right strategists are the big picture tacticians are the like technicians, they're they're good at its specific skills versus understanding how does this all work together, right? And uh, when it comes to good marketers, it's uh, how good are their questions about your target market? Like how obsessed are they about understanding them versus selling you on their services? So when you work with a company and you're going in fresh, um, what are the benchmarks that you try and take off in terms of uh, if you're trying to identify their, their buyer persona or their target market or like what are, what are, what is like the baseline strategy that you would implement or is it all customized depending on uh, who your client is? It, it has to be like, I think it has to be really, I mean, although you can systematize and you should just for efficiency, um, it really, uh, it needs to be about who you're trying to market to and the, the detail the level of research you've done to do that, right? Because you're actually going to get some of your best call to actions. You're going to get some of your best landing page copy. You're going to get some of the best um, verbiage that your your potential customer is going to respond well to by doing the research, by doing surveys, by doing interviews about uh, like uh, the day that they committed to buying your product. What was going on that day for them? Like getting a really a wide picture like like a like a holistic like you know like 360 degree view of yeah. who your customer and is there a, um is there a more effective way to do that outside of is there like um is it arming your your sales team or your sales force with the, with the right questions is it uh asking for example in my past what i found effective to get some sentiment from customers is to ask them why they chose to buy a product as a follow up email right after they've purchased it. And, great, yeah, yeah. and the reason why I've done that is because that's a meaningful, uh, a meaningful point in the customer buying cycle. They're enthusiastic, they're excited, um, and, they're, and they like your company, they love your company, they just, they just signed, right? So they're gonna give you reasons as to why they buy. And then what I've tried to do is I've tried to include um, the verbiage that they use or the features that they highlight in the marketing material. But that's, yeah. like, that's one. It's one example. So is there other ways that you can really tie into the customer that? Yeah. So uh, I think this is probably kind of what you're saying. Um, but one of the, like for a person listening right now that has landing pages and thank you pages and stuff like that, one quick, easy, actionable would be whatever your thank you page is. That should, uh, th- there's really two great ways of using your thank you page. One is uh, have a survey. Like you, like you say, like literally as soon as possible, once they've converted, Find out what what was it that worked for them. What is it? What are their expectations? Because this is going to give you an idea of uh, both how to segment uh, and or bucket them mm-hmm. on different messaging, automated email, drip campaigns, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But also the other great thing uh, for your thank you page when you're uh, in terms of like uh, uh, fully using the opportunity would be to have educational information about the product. That gets them more hyped on what they're about to get. You know, like um, it could be 
frequently asked questions in the form of a video. Yeah. You know, to, to get them kind of amped up. Yeah. It's even uh, another uh, great use of the thank you page is to validate the decision to have converted the previous step. Mm -hmm. So show them testimonials, show them brands that have also. And not helped. just before they're buying, like yep. reinforce yeah. after. Yeah, exactly. Get them, uh, help them get a cognitive bias that they made the right decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all very good. Um, I wanted to ask you one more thing because you mentioned that you're uh, an SEO your next SEO expert, specialist, whichever. Um, so the debate, obviously, for a company is where should we spend our dollars? Should we spend it on paid or should we spend it on organic? Um, what are your thoughts on which channel is best? Uh, well, it's, I think uh, you'll probably agree with this. It, you split test it uh, and let the data decide. You know, uh, I, I don't think it, it should be one or the other. Uh, it should be both and it should be uh, consistent. Marketing has uh, a compound effect. It pays in compound interest, right? Like you're, you're a fantastic content you put out there. Yeah, you post it uh, in a week, it's probably not going to turn into any business. But over time, it has a compound effect, right? So if, uh, if you have very short-term, tight deadlines, you're probably going to have to put more effort into paid ads to get the traffic. But if you're building a company to succeed in the long run, you have to be doing organic. Uh, you have to be doing great content too. It's uh, it's not one or the other. In fact, with a lot of startups, they don't necessarily have the budget uh, to do to do both, uh, and they 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 have to do organic for the most part, and they have to save that paid budget for conversions and direct ROI yeah. activities. But I think it's also you mentioned startups too, and that's a really good point. Like you have to figure out what your messaging is, what your brand is, what your value prop is. Or you're just throwing money down the, you know, down the toilet. So it's very important to map those things out first and to like hit those hit those benchmarks before you start spending money because that's not going to be the answer if you don't know what your actual product is. The uh, for sure, and the uh, one of the things I learned in uh, a couple of things I learned in entrepreneurship, uh, in this uh, my school program was one is called a smoke test or a fire test, a smoke test, and basically what that is is you you run Facebook ads. Um, to see if there is actually demand based on who clicks them. So it's an interesting way of testing headlines and that kind of stuff and testing, is there even a demand for what, this offer? Um, and the other thing from, from that specialization was to figure out your minimum viable product first before you put a whole bunch of money into it. If it's at its very basic level of a value prop, uh, if it's making money, then it's worth tweaking and improving. But if you haven't been able to uh, make money come out of it, by putting more and more money into it, it's a huge risk, right? Yeah. But if you've already proven your minimum viable product, your MVP, yeah. um, then you can you know, put more money into it. But if yeah. you haven't proved it yet, you're essentially risking a great deal. Yeah. 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 No, that's very good. Um, okay. So... Let's, I'm trying to think of where I want to take this. I think what I'd like to do, just because you've worked with a variety of different companies, I want to get your insights on um, the worst practices that you see in, the, in marketing um, across the industry. What are things that you see are very, are very prevalent now that you think are detrimental to a company's success? It's very prevalent now that... So it could be a, a, a practice, um, it could be a, a trend that you see that may not be. Um... Yeah, uh, I would say uh, advertisements that don't add value. Um, people, I would say that uh, cold calling and cold emailing and cold texting is a, is a big no-no. And it actually works has the potential to uh, work in reverse. So okay. take the example of the recent election we had here in Canada. Um, I don't know how it was over in Toronto, but I was getting phone calls and text messages from all political parties all the time. I don't know even how they got my information. And uh, the NDP was actually probably the biggest culprit, oddly enough. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was, it was interruptive and it was invasive. Mm -hmm. And although this is a political campaigning thing, it, it's using the same type of marketing uh, tactics that a lot of businesses use. Yeah. Um, it's I didn't ask for the service that you're you're 
you know, knocking on my door, yeah. uh, interrupting me, sending me calls I didn't ask for. Um, and there's just, there's so much of that and it seems to be getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to do. And that should be a warning. It's like email marketing, uh, cold emailing. Uh, it's because it's getting cheaper to do, it's becoming less and less and less effective. And, and I think that this whole like uh, spray and pray type mentality where none of the messaging is customized, obviously whoever's reaching at you just doesn't give a about your business or you. It's just a, it's a turnoff. Because I would argue that if somebody, if somebody did reach out to me cold and they knew about me and they knew about my business and they knew about my problems, I would be receptive to that much more so. I may not buy from him. I have no idea. But much more so than... A, a generic, especially God forbid, uh, a political campaign <laughs> message, which is yeah. like the who who wants that? Really, yeah. who wants that? Yeah, well, it's uh, by not they're not respecting your time if they haven't actually looked into who you are. So what is Scott about? Yeah. Uh, what what uh, based on what Scott's putting out there? What does he care most about? Yeah. Uh, if if I'm not able to add value to Scott's audience uh, in a podcast, then I need to rethink what I'm doing here, yeah. right? Because you're, just to use that as an example. No, I agree. And you know what? Even like one of the first things when we first jumped on this call, you were mentioning, you know, I've been putting out this podcast and I've been really focusing on putting out content and personal branding because that's, as you know, as, as an individual, I think that's very important to build your, like your, almost like your professional persona. And it's the, yeah. same, the same thing that I tell businesses when I work with businesses or when I work with my own company. You have to build out this persona online, and a lot of people don't even do that properly. But you mentioned a couple of points um, about different things that I haven't done yet that could be very valuable. And like these are things that I, I've been thinking through, but you know what I'm looking at. You know what I'm trying to do because you've done like five seconds of research before we jumped on the call. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're 10x more relevant than anyone, anyone else who I've spoken to just because you've done that small little bit of, of re and it's like so impactful and it takes really no effort. But the second you start caring about somebody, um, it, like it shows because, and I think it's sad that it shows so much, but the reason why it shows so much is because so few people actually do it. So when somebody does do it, it really stands out. 100%. And, but I think you just, uh, you came full circle around like uh, how I, uh, how I think that the, there is a problem uh, today, and it's that there's a lack of um, that lack of putting the time in to to make your message personal, uh, to make it not feel like it's a mass produced, um, disingenuous. Yeah, it's it's really yeah, it's putting the time in and showing that you care. What do they say that uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care? Yes. Is that it? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. I know all these bugs, but yeah. I, the heart of it is still there. Uh, no, and in fact, uh, just as kind of a side point, uh, when I was when I was looking uh, more at the cool stuff that you've uh, been working on, I, I, I increasingly I was like, well, I actually have a lot of questions I have for him. This is I don't know if I want to be talking all the time. I'd like I want to hear what you're doing, and because you're clearly doing a lot of things right. Yeah, thank you. It's, but um... uh, this podcast, I, I don't know how many people uh, how, uh, your average audience, but uh, my takeaway is that you're creating a lot of value. You're giving a lot of insight and you're, it's, um, you're giving a really nice palette of different taste. Uh, like in, that's like always that. been, you know, it's funny. Um, so to answer your question, it's about, about 500 downloads per episode right now, um, wow. on average. And that's, we've only, you know, I've only been doing this for three, four weeks now, the podcast. Now oh. keep in mind, keep in mind, that I did double down and build a huge audience on LinkedIn. And I was uh, running um, a website where I had contributors writing articles and that already had about a thousand people per day looking at articles on my website before I launched a podcast. So this is not like a putting it into the world day one type thing. Like there was already a, a very heavy focus on, on business and that was like my target audience. Cause I knew that eventually, well, like, like I, I mentioned before, like when I first started doing this, I was, I was doing consulting work. So I was trying to find clients. And it was obviously mostly marketing. So I was speaking about marketing and sales and trying to add value that way. Um, but now it's now it's sort of built out. So the second I put out something that's geared towards that audience, it definitely does have a little bit of momentum and traction. So um, yeah, so that's that's really where it's at now. I can't remember the second part of your question. I apologize. 
but I think you, you just about like putting this stuff out there. Um, and I, I, I what were you, you asked the second part that I totally forget. Your, and I think you and I have a similar uh, business philosophy in that, like you try and help as many people as oh, possible. Yes. And generalized. It, yeah. It's come back. It really does. Even if that person that you've helped or those many people, yeah. they may not directly, you know, uh, return the favor, so to speak. But the the more people you help, just the more uh, the more likely good things will propagate. I agree. So I'm a big fan, um, and I hate to plug him so often, but uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. So I'm I subscribe to his content creation and educational philosophy. Exactly. Nothing that I do is is gated. I don't I don't charge for anything. I don't run webinars. I don't uh, host master classes. I'm not pretending to be some online guru, business guru, and I can name a couple that I don't really enjoy um, because I find them shady as whatever. But I think that that I think that too many people putting out uh, educational resources online, unfortunately, um, don't monetize it the right way. Or I think that they play. I think they think that they're better than they are. And they're charging five thousand dollars for courses or two thousand dollars for webinar. Listen, I know everybody wants to make a buck, um, but right now, luckily, I'm fortunate enough to be to be working full time. So this is just something that I do as a as a hobby, and I don't need to charge for it. So I like just, and that's kind of. So I like putting my the stuff that I've learned through my career out there, and I think I have value because I've sort of seen success in the strategies that I've implemented throughout my different you know businesses and and companies I've worked for, um, but also the whole purpose of this podcast is to extract sort of the same type of just best practices because so many people have great stories and a lot of people you know I've listened to a couple podcasts and I find that they're very pigeonholed or they're very you know narrow in scope so I listen to one it's about sales leaders and I listen to another one it's about uh, channel partners and it's so specific and I just I think for me I'm just creating content that I would enjoy and I would consume if I was younger in my career, and I just wanted to learn things about business in general. I want to learn what a marketer does. I want to learn what somebody who goes and starts his own uh, marketing firm, entrepreneur. Uh, I want to learn what a consultant does. I want to learn about, uh, you know, corporate culture and why it's important. I want to learn about sales. Like, I want to learn all these different things. Um, and I just hope that I can sort of help facilitate that by finding people. That tell it. So that's really, and yep. there's no, you know, I don't do this for, I don't do this to to sell to somebody. It's really just because I enjoy it. Yep. This is a, a kind of a nerdy <laughs> hobby, but <laughs> I bet you get a lot of great feedback uh, from people like, hey, that last episode you did yeah. uh, about uh, what to watch out for when hiring. Yeah. Like, I never thought about that. Like, yeah, people that always blame other people or something like that. Yeah, yeah we definitely like red flag that yeah. rather than or what, what you know. Yeah. So but little things like that. So anyway, I appreciate it. That's very kind that you they mentioned that. So I hope that there's some value. I just, I'm, I'm I, a chance to support what you're doing. And uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, I'm, I'm happy to be, be here to, to have this chat. And also I, I look forward to staying in touch after this. And yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Well, your story, I like, I really do appreciate your story. And I didn't know your entire story before we spoke. And now it's even more impactful to me knowing like all the different, all the different steps you took, because some people it's very, some people, their story is not so interesting, right? Some people they have, they're very brilliant in what they do. Um, but they're like, oh yeah, you know, I went to, I went to Stanford and I got an MBA and now I'm like a, an SVP sales at a global tech company. And I'm like, okay, well, like good for you. And I'm sure like you're incredibly bright, but somebody, there's something about somebody who had to go through shit and just like figure it out and then come out on the other side, being as, uh, as knowledgeable as you are is, is very impressive because obviously it wasn't a linear road. And I think that that kind of person is somebody who I enjoy speaking with because there's a lot of depth to that person and they bring different perspective to the table as opposed to somebody who just had like a very, you know, one way straight, uh, straight path of success. And yeah. I really do think long term, it's again, failures add value to somebody. It makes us more dynamic. Yeah. Uh, and on top of it, um, we, uh, depending on how wide your interests are, and I, I think you're probably very similar. Uh, we get the advantage of divergent thinking, yeah. being able to have very different bodies of information, but being able to put it in, uh, together in such a way that you've got a new idea again. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, okay, so let's let's wrap this up. This has been going on for a little bit, so I don't want to I don't want to drag out the whole podcast, but I do want to capture a couple more things. 
before oh, before I close off, because um, it's been a really good conversation. Uh, if you were going to tell your 20-year-old self one thing, what would it be? Uh, don't, um, actually, no, stay in the positive. Okay. Uh, remain flexible uh, of what the future can look like. I was pretty, I was pretty convinced I was going to be a doctor um, and that this was going to be the way that I can make a gift of my life. Uh, but it very much wasn't. In fact, uh, one thing I didn't uh, mention, uh, where I volunteer now, it's a couple of times a month. I volunteer at Victoria Hospice. Mm -hmm. I get to hang out with dying people. Uh, I get to be of service and uh, help the nurses, help the family members, help feeding, you know, stuff like that. And I'm still able to acknowledge that part of who I wanted to be as a doctor without actually having to go to medical school. So there, um, so I'm still able to honor that part of myself. Um, and if, if I knew that that, that was even possible back then, I think I would have been, I think it would have helped me be more flexible in general. It probably would have taken a lot of weight off your shoulders and like stressors in terms of where you're going to end up in life. If you understood that life was not so black and white. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of young people, especially when they're going to colleges and universities, they think they have to do this program. They don't realize that uh, actually flexibility is greater strength than rigidity. Yeah. No? Yeah. Um, if you were going to speak to somebody and, and give them some resources, so it could be people that you like to learn from, or it could be books, audibles, podcasts. Where do you go uh, as a resource for information to grow professionally, personally, whichever? Yeah. Um, so obviously my friends. Yeah. One place. Uh, I have mentors. Uh, but in terms of like day to day, you know, if we take that Zig Ziglar. Yeah. Or whatever, whatever the quote about uh, motivation needing to happen daily. I think that uh, education and inspiration uh, should be on a daily basis, too. So uh, although I don't do podcasts as much, what I have been doing is it's called Blinkist and they're book summaries they're about between 12 and 20 minute audio book summaries of books that are so I'm able to get like this roughly maybe five books a week uh like yeah uh, synopsis but a, a little more detailed than that uh to be able to um mull new ideas like is that uh, is that is that not scribd because scribd has something like that it, but it could, it okay. Could be, uh, okay. I think uh, it, it's totally worth it if uh, if you're if you're like like myself. I'm I'm a little slower a reader actually, and that's why uh, audiobooks are yeah. uh, another thing I do. Audible, um, big fan of that. But I also do Blinkist because it's like the the book of the day for me. I get yeah. to. Um, I remember the, one of the first ones I did was a book called Anti Fragile, and it was a really um, because it's such a big, broad idea that, um, that you can have the thing that's anti-fragile, that the more you try and break it, the stronger it becomes. It's a whole new way of looking or a whole new um, filter yeah. of how you... So being able to be exposed to new ideas from people who have spent years researching their books and stuff and to uh, almost daily have exposure to new ideas, that's huge. Um, uh, so I would say Blinkist is good. Uh, Audible, I love it. Um, I'm a big fan of G uh, Gary Vaynerchuk as well. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm glad he moved away from the hustle porn. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> I think there there maybe was something a bit disingenuous for me about it. I don't think that the harder you work, the better things are going to become. Um, in fact, this is a bit of a paradox, but I find that the more I work on the inside of myself, the more my outside world changes, right? I think the that's really a very that's a very um, it's an interesting view, and I'm not I'm not in disagreement of it. But it's hard to it's hard to teach someone that. I think it's something that a lot of people have to discover on their own. I, I'm sure there's probably effective ways to teach it. I don't know them, but <laughs> it, it, like for instance, uh, things like meditation that yeah. would be an example of uh, doing the internal work, uh, learning how to be become more patient or compassionate or. Mm -hmm seeking to be better uh, at understanding those things when we work on the inside the way that our world around us changes um uh, rumi a, a sophist poet 
we may be familiar with, uh, he essentially said those words. He's like, um, the wise man, or pardon me, the, the young man goes out to try and change the world, uh, but the wise man changes himself and the world around him changes. And that's, that's true on, on multiple levels. So uh, coming back to the hustle porn, uh, the older Gary Vaynerchuk stuff, um, it's, it's, it's better to focus on pro- process than on product. And I think the hustle porn thing was about product all the time, rather than as you get your, improve your process, your product automatically improves. Yeah, no, very good. Um, is there anything that I didn't touch on that you wanted to, you wanted to discuss? Uh, no, like this is uh, this has been a lot of fun, and I I good. appreciate you taking the time, and uh, it's a likewise, uh, likewise, man. It was a good talk. I like it. No, yeah. well, I, I hope we get a chance to talk again. It doesn't have to be on a podcast, though. No, no, no. Good. Well, no, no. It doesn't it doesn't have to be on a podcast. We can connect yeah. after. It's all good. No, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, if people want to find you, where can they go? Do you have a website, LinkedIn? Yep. Yeah, um, LinkedIn. I'm a growth hacker with two R's. Okay. Um, Twitter, I barely use, okay. uh, medium. I'm, I'm just starting to get on there. That was one of the reasons I was like, damn, he's doing some cool stuff I need to learn about. Yeah. It's actually, um, if you, so what, uh, what, what you're referring to, if you're listening, um, I wrote a couple of deals for hacker noon. Uh, it was before they migrated, um, their entire website or most of their website off medium onto their own domain. Uh, I think that's where they're at right now. And I haven't submitted stuff in a while back. It, it's been about two, three months. But uh, yeah, I, there's a couple pieces of mine on Hacker Noon and on how the startup. You, and How do you get in there? Like, uh, I, I just mean, I just submitted. I just, I just, I had one piece that uh, did really well. It was on um, the open work, uh, like open workplace. Like okay. basically no baffle, like everyone open space type startup. And it was just basically a commentary on why it's not as effective as a lot of people think it is. Right. And that piece did really well. And that I sent that to, I think his name's David Snook. I think the founder CEO of Hacker Noon. And he reached out to me and he said, uh, like, yeah, like submit it. And then, um, and then I just kept submitting pieces from my medium account and they choose whether or not they allow them or they reject them. And so, and uh, another question I have is, do you do any uh, promotion and distribution yourself or do you just write the content and they, um so distribute it to their uh, followers they so they okay so how it works medium's changed a lot so bear with me because medium also now has a paywall that allows medium's editors to curate content and push it out but when i was still writing for hacker noon um i i, I didn't do anything myself if i wanted to promote it it would just be me you know using well i use buffer but <laughs> for for social media but i would just be pushing it out myself whenever i wanted uh, but they would take it and they would post it. And I think that they would actually choose the tags, if I'm not mistaken, or they would they would segment it into a certain category. And then they would also choose if it was like front page worthy. So it could, it could be under Hacker Noon, but it may not be front page worthy. And it may not be uh, newsletter worthy, because I also think they send out an email with their top stories. Uh, so I think, th- well, I know that that's their editors that curate and pick. So there's like different thresholds of of how well your article does on Hacker Noon, depending on if they like it or if it's relevant. They run series too. So there could be like a, a series they're trying to run. And if you write an article that fits into that series, um, oh. then they'll promote that or whatnot. So yeah, so once you get it in there, then they, they choose how they want to uh, how they want to promote it. There's no like paid option that you can pay for like a, an extra tier or something like that. Right. Because I'm, uh, I just recently uh, got accepted to. I think it's called Noteworthy. It's a medium publication. Yes, um, I, I know it. Yeah. Read, uh, and the the guy reached out and said, "Hey, we, we'd love to, you know, uh, have you consider doing some writing." And I'd never had that before. And like I said, I'm pretty new to medium. Now there's a few kind of like black hat type tricks I was doing mm-hmm. to get attention, um, like for instance, getting the social sharing component. So yeah. getting uh, yeah. I'm not sure if this is, uh, I mean, well, this is useful information. No, I think it's all good. It's all, listen, man, like this is, this is, this is, it doesn't matter. These are, (laughs) these are trade secrets. These are trade secrets. Fine. This is up to you. Whatever you want to talk about, however you expand your reach online, it's really your choice. Um, But go ahead. Yeah. To to give a a few kind of useful nuggets, uh, because I I came in strong talking about loving ripping off uh, 
yes. search engines. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to offer some more insight. Because please do. This has been the best. By the way, this has been the most in depth marketing conversation I've ever had. So, like, please continue. Okay. I really appreciate it. Oh, okay. Um, so here's some some kind of useful tactics that don't really take a lot of uh, extra work. In fact, uh, please reach out to me if there's anybody yes. uh, that, yeah. that wants to. I'll um, link your info in the show notes. But we like we can by by getting things like uh, social shares, like um, and social signals. They're like uh, retweets and yeah. Facebook shares. Uh, and all of these types of things, they trick the algorithm, whether it's medium publication or Facebook yeah. or LinkedIn into thinking that this is potentially viral content yes. right? because they've, there's no way. I think it's for every uh, minute of video uploaded to YouTube now, or yeah, for every minute, there's something like 40 hours of content. It, 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 just the, we don't have enough time to actually watch all the content. No, of course not. No. There's so much getting uploaded all the time. And it's not just YouTube. It's it's everywhere. So they have a, algorithms in place to be able to detect this might be, uh, this might have viral potential because of the amount of engagement that a post gets in the first 15 minutes to hour, depending on the platform. Mm-hmm. Right? So by, <clears throat> by uh, gaming them, by giving, by paying for uh, likes and... Yeah, and yeah. It'll, 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 it'll hit that algorithm and then it'll take off and be shown. Yeah, exactly. So I've heard, I've heard of, I've heard of things like this and there's different tools that can do this. I didn't, I didn't know this existed with medium and I don't actually know how the different platforms interact with each other. So I don't know uh, if YouTube can understand if, for example, uh, this video has been retweeted 500 times or if it's just the likes native to that platform or the comments that are native to that platform? Well, I've actually, I've uh, done some really interesting experiments like from my Airbnb listings mm-hmm. by gaming them to get the highest visibility. Um, uh, social networks have a combination uh, uh, of both their internal SEO, like you say, like within YouTube, say, yeah. it's got its likes and comments, etc. cetera. Um, but then it also has its external SEO. So how many, Twitter shares of that YouTube video or Facebook or Pinterest or, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, you wouldn't be able to fully game it just only taking one angle. So mm-hmm. you, by getting a really comprehensive, it helps future proof uh, your, your SEO. But right? you must have to know which, if you're going to do this, um, you must have to know which, uh, like what's the most optimal method of hitting this algorithm properly. So you, you, yeah, you'd want to, you'd want to have it happen uh, as quickly as possible yeah. within that first 15 minutes to first hour. You know, we, we know with things like um, engagement pod yeah. technology that uh, there's different ways to use that. You can yeah. have the five minute engage. Yeah. Uh, you posted the post a while ago, uh, but if you post a post recently, you'd want to have your engagements closer together. Yeah. Right, because that's going to help trick the. But if you posted this post, say a month ago, then by having by uh, flicking on your engagement tool uh, to every five minutes, it looks a little more natural. Then all of a sudden, it's just getting this burst, but yeah. there's no social shares associated with it. So okay. it looks like a flip, an anomaly that they would say, "Hey, someone's trying to game us." Yeah. So it's it's taking into account how they would be looking at it. So doing a whole bunch of social shares, and then uh, pumping a whole bunch of traffic through it. Yeah be a good way of tricking them into thinking, hey, this is... Have you actually it. mapped out like a process that's optimized for each like platform? Uh, I've, yeah, I mean, I've been, uh, I've been working on a few of them. Very uh, cool. Well, we don't have to record <laughs> your trade secrets, but I think it's very cool. Yeah, no, like uh, Cora, Cora is another one. Um, uh, the, and in fact, uh, for yourself, it, I'm not sure if you use it much. I, I I don't use it as much as actually I don't use it at all to be honest. I I use it for content ideas. So sometimes um, I'll put out. So if you look at my LinkedIn, you'll see me answering questions all the time. So mm-hmm. those are questions that I find on Cora, or they could be questions I find on LinkedIn. But if I don't have questions, I'll just go answer a question on Cora on video with my with my insight or perspective okay. on it, and it's just easy for me to not have to think about new content. Yep. So, but I know that's not really the way you're supposed to use Cora. You're supposed to be answering the questions, but. Well, no, it's a great, but th- that's a growth hack, right? Yeah. It's being able to, and then another useful growth hack with Quora would be like using Google and seeing yeah. what the autocomplete is. 
And then you have a, a better idea of like what kind of good questions to be asking. Yes. The court may not be ready or not uh, populated yet for. That's and a really good go point. Can we answer it? Pay for a bunch of upvotes. Yeah. And then your answer is permanently stuck to the top. You just have to make sure you have quality content. Yes. Yes, of course. Right? But yeah. it bypasses uh, their system. And the trouble is, and maybe this is going to answer one of the other questions around misconceptions uh, in the industry. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people don't realize this shit. This is so easy to game, unfortunately. Like I, like I just said with the core thing. Yeah. You can get 30 upvotes for less than 10 bucks. Yeah. Right? And then you've permanent, not permanently, but you've locked in a pretty reliable uh, traffic source for a question that your potential persona is asking. And people don't realize how easy this is and how everybody is gaming. All of your big influencers are doing gaming of some kind, gaming of the platforms they're on. Yeah. And if you don't think that, uh, that that's true, like at one point I didn't realize that was true, you're going to have books like I did that never sold anything because I yes. trust that I was <laughs> when it was bad, it was bad information. You actually, a lot of people uh, know the vulnerabilities of these platforms and that's why there are many of them are on the top, right? Yeah. So uh, it, it's, it's, it would be ignorant to deny that all of these platforms are gameable and because there's so many great, so much great content that just doesn't get visible because people think. Uh, no, it's unfortunate. Um, two, two points come to mind. I know, I know a gentleman, I don't, this is in all seriousness, not me, because I have no idea how to do this, but I do know somebody that can guarantee like an, like a, uh, an Amazon bestseller for a book or all, like it depends on when you list it and a certain time and like you can always get that bestseller again and again and again so i know that that's a thing um i know that i I was actually reading an article and i don't remember the name of the gentleman it was on linkedin but it was he was going on about how all your favorite influencers are really just growth hackers that know how to exploit a certain system at a certain point and it could be when the system is very immature and they haven't developed a very robust algorithm to to avoid that kind of thing or maybe just, 100%. yeah 100%. So. The, like the example with um i talked about in one of my co- uh, pieces of content it's called p- bumping i mm-hmm. uh, i first heard about it on uh facebook groups essentially it's you comment under your post in a group and then you delete the comment and then you comment again and delete the comment and do this repeatedly uh and then it tricks facebook because of the amount of engagement all the comments yeah it didn't recognize that you were deleting the comments. It just recognized right. that's what happening. And it would boost people's posts in, in, in Facebook, in Facebook groups. Wow. In private groups. And now this happened a few years ago. Um, and I was just hearing about it as often growth hacks happen. Yeah. Just as it, it, they were clamping down on it. They were yes. figuring it out. I was like, oh, great. I yeah. just found out it's too late. Plus, I didn't have Facebook groups. Um, but I, I was on LinkedIn a few years ago and I realized that that actually is, it was, I was able to get traffic in, uh, LinkedIn groups when they were a little more, yeah. used, uh, by doing bumping because they didn't actually have a, a, a mechanism in place to prevent that type of gaming. So I was able to, and I had my, um, my special tracking URL so I could see all the traffic that was coming to these, that was targeted in these groups. And it was lots it was, we're talking hundreds of clicks uh that's, proposed that's and very people, powerful stuff like you think about like that's targeted traffic and it's niche after, traffic. yeah we, we made we got more traffic for free with this method in fact i even used uh other other employees accounts to help get that immediate engagement up yeah. front so that we would be getting um in linkedin groups you'd get uh emails to those group members about the the hottest topic stuff and we yeah. would always be top so it was like yeah. so that's an example of how easy it was now you can't do that easily today uh, i don't know if you, you talk much about Glempod, but um yeah well that's another thing so it's uh, yeah i i know that i know the service so it's just about yeah. getting as much engagement as you can up front so that's like so that's specific to linkedin yeah so i'm but, sure i don't know if there's other ones like that across other social platforms i'm sure there are so, um, you know, it's funny, as, as we keep talking, I, I realize, oh, that's actually, there's more I should tell you then. Uh, but engagement tools are one of the, one of the, um, one of the huge value adds that yeah. uh, hackers need. 
So LEMPOD is an example of one growth hacking engagement tool, but there are so many now. Uh, I had 160 Instagram bots at one point back in 2015. Mm -hmm. So I've experimented a lot with different bots and different engagement tools, but the, uh, there, there's a lot, I think there's one called Hubert where it's similar to buffer in that you can schedule posts. Yeah. In addition to that, you're able to say you have a YouTube uh, channel. I'm sure you do. Yeah. yeah. You have your YouTube uh, channel automate liking and commenting on other people's channels, hmm. right? So that you're able to drive more organic traffic back to your, um, that's one example. I mean, the Twitter and Instagram, similar thing with the follow unfollow bots. Yeah. Right. And the commenting and, and that, I, I think that that opportunity is gone. I don't really recommend that for people anymore. Um, no, I think that, I think that you have to be, I think you have to be careful about where you're spending your time and energy and effort. And you also have to be careful that if you are going to do any of these things, there's a good chance that it goes against the terms of service for, so you, your account could get shut down too. So, so if it's a, you know, the business account, it's, it's, you have to be very careful about this stuff. So I remember building a uh, one Instagram account for a previous company from zero to 42,000 using uh, a bot. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, not just a bot, you ha you need content, you need yeah. good content and you need an audience, but the, it, it was a very inexpensive way of creating uh, a real community uh, in, in B2B, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, versus business to consumer yes, yeah. because you have multiple people you have to sell to versus B2C, it's just one person you have to sell. Mm -hmm. So uh, getting, and everybody has the potential to shut the deal down in B2B. Yeah. So by getting as many different uh, people to buy on, you know, and communicate to them in the platforms that they want to be communicated with. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's more sophisticated. When do you think, um, do you think there will be a point where companies that don't understand these tools are just not going to be able to compete? I think, uh, they, there's, there's actually don't... a book on this too, by the way, um, about the ex director of marketing at American apparel. Uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but it was along this line where he was understanding how with like a fraction of his marketing budget. He like he he was like from the old world of marketing, right? Where it cost millions to generate this many, you know, impressions, engagement, conversions, whatever. And then all these startups who had no budget had to understand how to game systems to get traction. And even actually, I I'm gonna let I want to just tell over one more thing while we're recording because it was a very cool um it was a very cool growth act that he referred to in this book. And I should probably figure out the name of the book for start quoting, but whatever. It's a really cool point. Um, uh, he. It was when um, Hotmail was just just launching, and at the end of every Hotmail, or s I may be mincing this story, but basically it said "made made with love" or "please share." Or there was like a, a a silly little like heart with a call to action that was at, that was imprinted on the bottom of every single person's email, and it, it, yeah, yeah. It, and it had prompted. And this is like obviously this is not a bot. This was built by the platform. But just an example of how you're using zero dollars in in marketing spend or ad spend, and that one simple trick that is just like massively scalable and and touches so many different people, that basically is what made Hotmail a thing. Yep, it made it go viral. Yeah, yeah. So I can't remember what the name of the book is or the guy who was speaking. But anyway, that's I'll I'll have to find it and and link it below. But so yeah, with with, uh, with good engagement tools, I would I would say Lempod is really fantastic if you're on uh, if you're doing business to business and you want to um, either generate more leads, uh, you're uh, in some way related to the HR field of recruiting. Obviously, mm -hmm. Lempod is for that. Um, but then there yeah there's there's depending on who your audience is, finding out what platforms they spend the most uh, time on, and then figuring out what are what are the inherent flaws of the, the platform, right? Like yeah. what, whatever something's strength is, it has a uh, equally powerful weakness, right? Yeah, because it, well, the, the, weak, the, the strength is the reach. So how do you exploit that reach? Yeah, well, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the strength. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you've probably heard this before. Uh, every, you can't have a superpower 
unless it can be equally used for evil. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I so, Googled it while we were talking. It's, it's Ryan Holiday, and the book is Why All Marketers Should Be Growth Hackers. And oh. Hot, Hotmail put um, PS, I, what did they put at the bottom of their emails? They put, um, so he was the ex director of, of, of marketing at American Apparel. And at the bottom of each Hotmail said, PS, I love you at the bottom of each Hotmail sent out. And right. I guess that was, and there was a call to action to sign up for Hotmail beside that. And that prompted everybody to, to sign up. And that was a viral, that, that's just a, a, one, one line of text built into Hotmail. And that, that built Hotmail into a, a, I don't know when it was sold, if it was for billions, um, but it was a, an enormous, obviously, um, email. It didn't cost much. You know, exactly. Stood out. Yeah. Another, um, another interesting one is with, uh, let's say you're doing paid ads for Facebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the ways to gain Facebook in this way is driving some fake traffic to your ad before you make it an ad so that the metrics show, hey, this is great content. Mm -hmm. Then you lower your cost for sending out the ad. Right? Oh, like, cause like, cause you're, because they now Facebook knows it's quality and now yep. you're, you're caught. Oh, that's very smart. I've never thought about that before, but that's, that's so there are all these interesting vulnerabilities in the, their, their systems yeah. right? Yeah. that are totally, in my opinion, subject to be exploited. Uh, yeah. yeah. Here's another useful one. Uh, before, before we go, do you ever do uh, YouTube ads? I haven't. No, I, that's one thing that I haven't taken advantage of. So. So for, uh, this one's an easy one to remember. And if, if forever, uh, you're like, Hey, what was that thing that Dara said about YouTube ads? Yeah. Because again, um, when you're doing your ads, you're, you set your, your bid price, you only get charged after 30 seconds. So if they, they bounce before the 30 seconds, you don't get charged for the YouTube ad. Mm -hmm. Now you obviously want to have it over 30 seconds, whatever your video is, but then every week or two go in take the average of what your PPC was. Mm -hmm. So your bid price will be like, say 10 cents. Yeah. And for the few days, you will literally spend 10 cents per view. But then after a week or two, you go in and then you take the average and then you'll notice, oh, it's now the average is eight cents. So you drop your, uh, your bid price to eight cents and you keep doing this until you're paying one cent hmm. per view. That's now, crazy. Very way of getting low cost ads for video and video is the future. I yes, mean, I agree. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, if, if you want to stay on top of uh, SEO for the next couple of years, here's all, here, here's all it is. It's video, it's voice and it's schema schema. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with uh, it's like when you type into Google uh, search and it shows you boxes of information now that's yes. schema. Okay. Okay. Um, so those three things are the future of SEO. If you want to, if you want to cement a lead right now, I would say immediately do video because there's just not a lot of well indexed video and it's, it's already beating search engine results uh, for search, right? They're showing YouTube videos and regular search now because, yeah. of this, because it's just the way that we're transitioning. So, uh, yeah, probably given a lot to unpack here. So I think it's very good. I, I, I understand most of what you're saying, um, because I'm a big fan of, of trying to find ways to, uh, on a budget, reach a massive amount of people. So I think that if people are totally, if people are listening to this and they're just like, what the hell is he talking about? I would say, you know, take it slowly with a grain of salt. Just understand that um, the ability to reach massive amounts of people, regardless of whether or not you use a tool or you use an algorithm, hack or we use something as simple as uh looking for if you want to create content if you're a content marketer and you want to find a uh, content that's going to obviously speak to a lot of people you look for a question on quora you answer that question on linkedin if that if that question has a ton of upvotes on quora obviously it's going to be a popular topic to speak about on linkedin that's violating nobody's terms of service and that's a very uh white hat type of of hack Per se. Yeah, so totally. it depends on your taste for or your appetite for what you want to do, but there's it's something you should think into. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or look into. All right. Thank you, Dara, so much. That was an incredible interview. Uh, we really went into the weeds in a great way. Uh, everything from the psychology of selling, why people buy, human interaction and body language to best practices, current landscape of marketing, and then the most cutting edge emerging uh, marketing trends, technologies that can help 
that can help leverage your ability to understand why people buy uh, the, the messaging and branding that a company has to create for itself. And then using these two drivers to augment your presence through all of these different marketing technologies, uh, social media technologies, and all the avenues and, and tools and tricks and growth hacks that we have available today to, to bring your message to a much wider audience. Uh, Dara provided some amazing insight. So thanks again, Dara. I really, really appreciated that chat. If you want to speak with Dara, you can or hit him up on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash in slash growth hacker with two R's. Uh, this has been another sales versus marketing where we speak with sales, marketing, and business leaders. If you haven't already, wherever you are listening to this podcast, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, Acast, TuneIn, iTunes, please leave a like, a share, leave a comment. Any rating is fine as long as it's a five-star rating. Uh, you can also catch this podcast on YouTube, youtube.com slash C slash ROI overload. So please uh, leave a like or a comment there as well and share this podcast with your friends, families, peers, coworkers, anybody who you think would enjoy it. Um, you can also, uh, if you have any people that you'd like to hear on this podcast, please hit me up and I will interview them. You can find me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash in slash S Douglas Clary or shoot me an email, S Douglas Clary at gmail.com. This has been another sales versus marketing. I hope you all enjoyed. Everybody have a great week. Have a productive week and we will speak again soon. Bye now. Welcome to Scott's Thoughts where we dissect some of the main points that we just spoke about in the sales versus marketing podcast. So this week we spoke with Dara Grove White who is a digital growth guru, mastermind, growth hacker, whatever you want to call it. Uh, outside of the tactical insights that he gave over in, in our discussion, I wanted to highlight a couple things that are super important. Um, the first is understanding the psychology of selling, understanding human interaction, understanding how to build these relationships. If you can't do that, it doesn't matter how good your product is, how good your marketing is. The most effective way to engage with people and build that relationship is understanding how people function and being able to build that relationship with them. Um, another point that I really liked that he brought home was the disconnect between creator and distribution from a marketing point of view. So the first point, psychology of selling was sales. Disconnect between creator, creator and distribution is marketing. So understand that even though you're creating great content, you have to understand how to get it to the masses. So you have to, you have to be proficient in your different mediums and your different channels uh, and your different tool sets. If you, if you know how to growth hack and get your if you know how to growth, I can get your content to a massive audience. Uh, obviously, you want to maximize your ROI or dollars spent because you don't want to uh, you don't want to go broke getting it out there. But just creating it isn't good enough. You have to understand how to get it to the people who care. So obviously, there is a huge disconnect between creator and distribution, and that's something just to keep in mind when you are creating content and you are putting it out into the world. Uh, so let's, let's see, we got one sales point that I loved, one marketing point that I loved. And then the last point that I really, really liked was his, uh, his strategy for, for forward thinking marketers who are working within organizations that may not be as forward thinking. If you are trying to manage up, if you are trying to effectively, uh, effectively change, manage, uh, your entire organization and move them in the right direction that's probably one of the most difficult things to do as a leader or somebody who's trying to affect change within an organization because um, you want to get your ideas actioned. You want to get your ideas implemented and it's very hard to do if your leadership isn't buying in. So the one tip that he gave that was a leadership lesson for us on how to manage up is to launch your initiatives as pilot projects, which removes some of the fear around the initiative that you're taking on it also allows you to map out KPIs if they haven't already been effectively mapped out. And it shows that you, it also, and thirdly, and lastly, uh, it allows you to showcase how effective your pilot project is. So it just removes some of the fear uh, and some of the apprehension that upper management may have about you as a marketer within an organization trying some new things. So that's another uh, another great takeaway. So one sales, one marketing, one leadership, way more that we learned in the podcast. So go back and listen again with the pen and paper if you haven't already. This has been another Scott's Thoughts. Thanks again for listening. Hope everybody has a great week, has a productive week, and we will speak again soon. Bye now.